Well, we have um, criteria for each category of induction. The criteria is that you have to have have won at least one world championship um, and then we we also say that you need to be retired from the sport um, we kind of apply that loosely because in some cases like a team roper you could team rope until you're 75 or 80 you know but you're not going to ride bulls that long obviously Hey, hit that subscribe button now. You're going to like it. Welcome to the Luke Branquino Show. Our next guest is the director of the Pro Rodeo Hall of Fame, Kent Sturman. Kent, thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. A lot of people, and nobody really under, realizes that I've known you for a long time, since my high school days, when you, I believe, were the national director, if, that, if that's correct. Yes, the executive director for the National High School Rodeo. Yeah. yeah, so you've been in this game, and we've talked on the phone um, how neat it is for you when you were the, the executive director to see the guys, the contestants that have competed at when you were there now through the pro ranks now into the hall of fame and i mean that that's got to be something pretty cool for you to be able to sit there and watch it is um you know every year when i was at the nfr sitting in the stands and you know looking down the day sheet and so many of them were were names i either knew or recognized as being uh coming up through the high school ranks and you know it, it's a real sense of pride that you know that the that youth rodeo program is is doing its job and and developing good cowboys and cowgirls that are going to go on up through college and professional ranks and um yeah so it's and now that being a few years ago let's say <laughs> to now being uh, the director at the hall of fame now some of those cowboys such as yourself that that were in the professional ranks are now being inducted into the hall of fame so it's kind of come full circle for me and and it's really a, a really cool feeling well for me, yeah i could imagine i mean even for me getting the call and and your name associated with that call obviously being the director there to me it brings back a lot of memories of the steps that we take in our lives to get to the positions we're in and and where we're at and to me i was like man that's been a while ago that, that when i first met kent and now we're we're going to meet on a on a obviously on a different stage um with stuff that i have you know worked so hard at to accomplish through rodeo and kent's going to be right there when he's seen me in my high school days now he's seen me after after my you know careers ended and, and going into the hall of fame and it, it means a lot to me to have people like you that have dedicated so much to the sport to help grow it to help make it better well thank you um yeah it's it's uh i never really thought of myself as being uh, in a position where I'd be running a museum one day, you know, when, back in those days when I was with High School Rodeo, but it's certainly within within our industry. And, you know, I think the I've always been a, a, a student of history and I've always enjoyed history. So now being here at the Hall of Fame where we, we preserve the stories and, and the artifacts and the uh, events of professional rodeo and can are able to communicate those to rodeo fans and museum guests. Um, it's just a really great uh, opportunity and it's an important part of our sport because if, if you don't remember history, you're doomed to repeat it. Is that what they say? And right. Maybe in some cases repeating history is good. In some cases it might not be, but, but just being able to to communicate to people the story of professional rodeo and the, and the people that make up the sport and and their journeys and the things that they've done to accomplish um, what they did in their career and and ultimately ultimately make it to this pinnacle of, of a hall of fame is is uh, pretty cool to well i got to and it's been 15 16 years ago i might have been after it might have been even before i won my first world championship i got to tour the hall and uh, we were obviously in town for, for Colorado Springs for the rodeo and we had an extra day and, you know, got to go through the, the PRCA office and, and then went down into the Hall of Fame. And like I said, that had to been, it was either 2004 or 2006. I can't remember, but to hear or to see what the, the hall is about 
And I think every everybody that owns a PRCA card or is a member of the PRCA or if anybody for that matter should go through there to see what you guys have done and how you have, like you said, preserved you know the history of rodeo. For everywhere, anything from the old rodeo flags to the Queen's outfits to, I mean, and this is dating way back when to, to modern day. And uh, now, granted, when I walked through there, I never in, in a million years imagined me having my own little, you know, little area there, which you know, again is, is still a little bit surreal. Uh, but what you guys do there and what you've done is, is sure impressive. And you can almost, you could hear the voices of the past echoing through the halls. You can, and um, you know every every piece in every display has a story and, and has um, you know a, a specialness to to the st overall story of that cowboy or of our um, organization, and and uh, you know it's just for me it's knowing some of these people and, or certainly knowing the stories you go through there, and you can feel their presence almost yeah. and to the point where some people believe that the hall of fame is haunted but i don't particularly uh, prescribe to that but but you definitely get a sense of feeling when you go through here and you're looking at these items and reading about these people you you can definitely feel a presence and and uh, um you know just you can almost uh see them going through that experience and winning that title and and it's it's uh it's an amazing, uh, and be, to be able to convey that to visitors is really important because, you know, it takes a lot of people to make rodeo successful and not just the cowboys or the stock contractors or the animals, but it takes the fans and the committees and everybody involved. And, and we get people through the museum that are diehard rodeo fans that can recite stats back to me better than anyone. And then we get people that, you know, have never been to a rodeo, don't know it, don't understand it, and they just want to learn more. Well, and that's what it should be about, especially those fans that are those folks that aren't fans. You know, you, you send them through the hall like that, and and then all of a sudden, well, this is something I need to get into, it's something I need to learn about. And, and I think that that's huge for the sport of rodeo because you know as well as, as anybody that it's such a, it's a great sport, but it's, it's so niche. I mean, there's not, we need to expand it. I mean, let's be honest. And with things like Yellowstone and everything going on, I think it is growing. But to have the Hall of Fame and have it accessible to people that just want to come check it out, it, it's just going to help grow and enhance it like like it needs to be. And uh, when I was walking through there many years ago, I was thinking, man, that's that's kind of a neat display they put in there. Or why did they put that in their display? Or you know, this and that. And now I'm in the situation and. and what am I going to put in my display? You know, I got boots, I got belts. Uh, I told Lindsay, my wife, I said, I, I, what I want to do is I have a shirt when I first started rodeo with a sponsor on it. And I have one of the last year's shirts with my sponsors on it. I have the very first PRCA buckle I ever won at Pace in Arizona. I have the very last PRCA buckle I won at St. Paul, Oregon. These are things I kind of want to stick in there and and, um, and you know, for, for people to see the beginning of my career to, to the end. and. You know, it's still a hard, it's it's still really hard. What am I going to stick in there? And actually, I'm going to call you after this and, and lean on you a little bit. But, um, you know, just to see some of that memorabilia that folks put in there um, that obviously means so much to them or they wouldn't have put it in there. Yeah. And and like I said, every piece has a story. And, and you just mentioned the last buckle you won through the PRCA was at St. Paul, Oregon. And there, that committee's being inducted I know. with you. So there's that connection. And, you know, there's just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of stories that that have that specialness and connection to uh, from one aspect of the sport to another. And, um, you know, it's just uh, if, if each of these items could talk and tell their tell their story, uh, it would be amazing. But uh, you, you somehow you get an understanding of what those what those connections and what those stories are uh, just by being here and, and looking through the museum. Well, I'm excited to be there. I'm not obviously going into the Hall of Fame, but just to see what you you all put into it because I've heard stories. You know, the the workforce, the effort that gets put into making this such a great event. Um, t tell us a little bit about that. I mean, how many how many people do you guys have working on this to 
to make it what it is. Well, um, the Hall of Fame uh, staff is just four full-time people and three part-time. So, and other museums our size will have, you know, 20, 30 times that number of, of employees. And so I am amazed every day. I have, a, I have a tremendous team of people. They are incredible and they love their jobs and they're totally dedicated to this facility. But, you know, we also have resources through the PRCA and their staff and, and stuff to, to draw upon. But our actual staff is four full-time people. And right. I'm amazed every year at what we could accomplish here with just such a skeleton crew. And um, inductions is a tremendous event um, with everything that we do. It's a three-day event. We have a golf tournament that uh, is a fundraiser for the hall. And then we have the, the Cowboy Ball, which is the big dinner the night before. Inductions, which is also a fundraiser. We'll do an auction and, and stuff there and honor the, the class. And then the actual ceremony on Saturday morning. Um, so it's, it's a lot of planning. It's a lot of work. And, and we have a lot of support. Um, from volunteers, from our sponsors, from the PRCA. Um, but at the end of the day, it's it's me and three other people that are putting this together. Well, I know just from me reaching out and doing whatever I needed to do to get to you guys what you needed, it's it's always answer the first ring and, you know, what can we do to help, you know, help facilitate this for you. And, and I know that's just not, it's not an easy feat with everything else you have going on and then you have some dumb cowboy calling you. That is pretty self-explanatory in the email, uh, except for, for this guy. But, uh, you know, I appreciate, you know, how the willingness you guys are to help make it an easy transition for us. And, um, again, what what a special, special three days. And, and when I got the call, they're like, so what are you doing July, you know, 13th, 14th, 15th? And, and I didn't even know what they were calling about. I just seen a PRCA number. I'm like, oh, I, I'll be up at Calgary doing television work up there for them. And I'm like, Oh, do you think you can take a couple days off? And I'm, well, I mean, not really. I got a contract, and then they told me what was what was happening, and I was being inducted into the hall. And I was like, well, I'm sure that they will they will go ahead and give me a couple days off. And fortunately, the Calgary crew has been awesome. Cindy Gillies up there has been absolutely amazing. I called her, and you know, she was just very happy for me. Said, yeah, we'll find somebody to fill in for you. And, you know, so to get that call and then be able to work with. Calgary and let them give me the day or two days off. It, it, it's pretty awesome. And how many how many people are you expecting at the event? At the Cowboy Ball, we're uh, expecting about 460. That's maximum capacity because we have that event right here at the Hall of Fame. Um, and we were we've been sold out the last few years. Um, so we're expecting. And then at the ceremony on Saturday morning, we'll have well over 500 people. And that's family, friends, committees. I mean, you got people from all over coming in for that yes and the the ball is a it is an advanced ticket required because we obviously have to play in with the cater and everything the ceremony is open to the public uh just tickets available at the door and so yeah there'll, there'll be people coming from all over we are um you know going on at the same time as the Pikes Peak or Best Rodeo and the NFR open here in Colorado Springs. So there are people coming for inductions that'll go to the rodeo and people that are coming for the rodeo that will hopefully come to inductions. So um, it's a, it's a, going to be a great weekend. Well, I mean, we got a lot of great class. Cody Wright, uh, two-time world champion, Doyle Gillerman, uh, PRCA, our team open world champion, Kenny Claybaugh, Butch Knowles, Tom Feller, which Tom, uh, I always have a special place in my heart for Tom Feller because every time I'd have my boys with me, he'd always pull out a $5 bill, $10 bill, $20 bill. He'd hand them cash. And when I told him, I, you know, <clears throat> who was all getting inducted, which the boys were all ecstatic anyway, they're like, hey, Tom, Tom Feller, that's the guy that always gives us money, isn't it? And I was like, yeah, that's Tom. And, you know, Tom has been a staple in the industry forever. He has, and he's worn a lot of hats in this yes. organization. You know, obviously he's he's been a clown and barrel man, and you know, and he's of course tied very closely to one of our sponsors, and and uh, been on the board of directors, and and uh, yeah, he's just done a lot. And it's of course the Justin Sports Medicine Program and the Justin Cowboy right. Crisis Fund, two very very important pieces of our organization. That, that Tom's very involved in and responsible for. Well, and then, you know, we have rodeo committees, St. Paul, Cowtown Rodeo, uh, Barrel Racer, Sherry Combs Johnson, and uh, then notable Faye Ann Horton Leach. And to have these 
folks in this class, and, and you talked about St. Paul, Oregon, uh, was the last rodeo I'd, I'd won, and I got a you know PRCA buckle at, and those rodeos have always have had a special place in, in about every contestant's heart, but for me, St. Paul was always special. I'd, I'd won it three times, uh, but the Christmas trees in that arena, uh, a, lot, a lot of people don't know they need to go check it out. Um, either go to the rodeo, watch it on the Cowboy Channel, or, or just Google it because St. Paul has, has always been just uh, one of those rodeos that I've, I would go out of my way to go to. Yeah, and the, the committees are so important to, to our sport. And obviously, if it weren't for them, we wouldn't be having these events. But um, yeah, I, St. Paul's unique. Um, I have never been there. I need to make that make that one. I've been to several. And then Cowtown. I mean, the oldest weekly rodeo right. organization is on the East Coast in New Jersey. Who would have thunk it? You know, <laughs> and, and we get people, we get museum guests in, you know, that when they hear about the Cowtown Rodeo in New Jersey, they're just in shock that, you know, some people that live right back there fairly close to them and had no idea that they existed. And, and you know, the, the history of, of our sport, you know, from you, you typically think of, of rodeos being in the West and, and the Midwest, but, uh, you know, it's there's great, great rodeos and great cowboys all over this country and Canada and, and, and places beyond. So, yeah, it's a, it's a great, uh, class this year for sure we talked about rodeos being on the east coast the the late uh larry mayhem i had a great conversation with him about madison square garden uh you know there was a lot of rodeo a lot of western culture back on the east coast that it, you know it, it's still there but it's not as prominent as it used to be uh unfortunately but uh, like you said cowtown i'd never been i've always heard great things about it um but to have that, the rodeo heritage still going live and strong as it is there, it's it's great. Hopefully we can keep it going. Yeah, and I just uh, learned a little bit more about Cowtown when they sent some information for their induction is, you know, they're, they sit on some pretty um, prime property apparently. And through the years, they've been offered huge amounts of money to sell that property for development and they've held stuck to it and you know it's a family that that has been passed on from generation to generation and they talk about in their video about the importance of that heritage and that history and being able to leave something for your uh, children that you know that he he basically said there's no amount of money in this world that will make me sell this property and and and, and stop this rodeo and you know when you hear stuff like that it it's just really, um, it does your heart good because uh, so much of, of today's world is all about the money and all about development and progress. Right. And, um, you know, th those are, are great stories too. So, um, you know, in the Madison Square Garden, Boston Garden, that those those historic rodeos back there. And, um, you know, that's it's how we all, if it weren't for the, the rodeo in 1936 on Boston Garden, the PRCA may not have existed. Yeah, that's a great. You know, it's, it's a tremendous uh, story in history that, that uh, we're very fortunate to be able to tell people about. Well, so much, like you said, history back in, in the East Coast and rodeo. And uh, Larry was saying when, when the Cowboys came to town, it was the, like it was a parade. People, it, it was similar to Calgary, I guess. Calgary, when you go up to the Stampede, they shut the city down for the 10 days of the stampede and you don't go to work you, i mean you're pretty much said you go enjoy the rodeo go enjoy the the time and that's what larry was saying how it was with with the cowboys when they showed up to new york city because it was the fans it was a, a escape from reality of the grind uh, you know the these cowboys are coming to town to put on a show for us and in a way it's sad that we don't have that you know that sense of of western heritage like we did back in the day on the on the east coast like we like we did yeah and you know today it's about uh, it's a it's a little different in how the sport is it, it functions you know is that you you compete in a rodeo and you got to get down the road to the next one because there's multiple rodeos in a week's time you know back then when they came to town for the rodeo at madison square garden they were there for several days and they they stayed and competed and then it was time to move move on you know and back in those days, they they used to 
get everybody involved in the rodeo out either in the arena or at some location and took a huge group photo of everybody from the, the contestants and the personnel and the entertainers and the rodeo band there was always a band at every right. rodeo back then and you know the, the native american entertainers and, and just anybody and everybody that had anything to do with with the rodeo and we have uh, photos of the Madison Square Garden. Most of the time, those group shots were taken in the basement of that historic building. But a couple of years, they lined everybody up on horseback out in front of City Hall of New York City. Uh, wow. that, that would not happen today. No. So, and, and, you know, it's just that how the sport has changed is really, is really interesting. But those those are priceless photos and you guys have those photos in the museum i mean that's that's stuff that the public can go see yes yes and uh we we recently just finished um last year a three uh year project where we uh secured all, all of those photographs they they had been in our collection but some of them had were in pretty bad shape and we got them all preserved and repaired and digitized and so now they'll you know those images will be um, safe for for decades and decades and but we have the originals and and some that we put out on display and and uh, that's just something that you know you can't hardly put a price tag on that no you, you definitely can't and to be able to and i i'm i'm really excited to to take my kids through and you know and walk them through and show them you know from the start of rodeo to now where it's how it's evolved and how I guess styles have changed and how styles have probably changed and kind of came back full circle and then they've changed again, you know, and uh, which you being right there, you get to see it all the time, but just to let them see the history of rodeo and, and it's always something I've never wanted to force my kids to do anything. If they want a rodeo, great. If they want to play baseball, great. But to be able to take them there and see that this is what they could shoot for potentially if they do want a rodeo, you know, I think that's it's every parent's dream to be able to give them an opportunity like that. Yeah. And, you know, uh, being in the Hall of Fame is, is unfortunately the nature of it, it either comes at the end of your career or at the end of your life. Right. You know, and some, some people that are inducted have been deceased. So it's really special when, when the inductee is, is still alive. And, and in your case, a, a young man, that you can share that experience with your family. Um, because not everybody has that opportunity. So, well, going, you know, taking them through there and showing them my heroes, you know, the Jones family, John W. Jones and Junior, Senior, uh, you know, anybody that I looked up to as a competitor saying these are guys I looked up to and people I wanted to be like. And now I'm in the same hall as them. You know, I'm hoping that'll, well, I'm, I know it will kind of light a fire under them, no matter which direction they want to go in life to to shoot for the stars, you know, and, and uh, hopefully land right there with people you look up to. And, and again, I don't care if it's golf, tennis, whatever, just always set your goals high and, and give yourself the opportunity to try to achieve them as, as what I did when, when I walked through there, you know. So I just, it, again, it's, it's surreal for me to still think about getting to be put in that hall with, with those folks. Yeah, yeah, I can't. I can't even imagine what that must be like. But it's seeing it from from our side of it and our perspective is, you know, that's what that's what we're all about. We're a Hall of Fame, and we're in the business of of inducting people and honoring them for their achievements and their great contributions to our sport. And and then um, being able to share that. Um, I, re I remember one of my first inductions when I first started here. We inducted a, a, a champion from back in the Cowboy Turtle Association day. You know, and unfortunately, that he obviously was passed away. But the closest living relative that was still alive that we could find was a great granddaughter, and wow. she had she had never met uh, her great grandfather, but heard the stories of his rodeo and stuff. And I remember in her acceptance speech that she talked about through this experience of him being inducted and her being involved, she finally feels like she knows her great grandfather, and and. Um, you know, it just totally turned her into a rodeo fan for life then. But, you know, we were able to give her that gift right. of getting to know her great grandfather. And, um, you know, you just kind of assume that that these stories and, and things are passed down to generations, but in some cases they're not. And when you lose people, you lose those stories. So we're pretty fortunate to have this these jobs here. We we love what we do and and 
we, we take this honor uh, and this uh, responsibility of preserving our history and telling our stories pretty seriously. Well, you mentioned the induction speech. <laughs> I know I talked to you. I, it was the, the day I got the call, I go to the gym every morning and I sit down on the bike for five minutes and I start typing out on my phone, on my notes, like what I want, where I want to start, where I kind of want to finish and everything in, in between. And then I called you and I said, so how long are these, you know, these speeches kind of supposed to be? And, and uh, I think I started reading mine and I was maybe 10 minutes into it and I wasn't even halfway through it yet. So I'm going to have to cut mine down a little bit to make it around that three to five minute deal. But I always joke around, like I write stuff down and I get notes. And then when I start talking, I forget I even have a piece of paper in front of me. So I'm hoping that this time I'll stay focused and not cry too much, which I'm sure is it's common at the Hall of Fame when you're reading your speech. But uh, I'm still a little stressed, a uh, little a little anxiety in, in that deal of in that aspect of it yeah well you know it and this is a once in a lifetime honor and you know it from our side it's a little bit difficult to tell someone that they can only talk for a certain period of time right. because you know you need to thank the people that you need to thank and tell the stories that you need to tell because this is a major achievement and and it is a once in a lifetime thing and, a, and one of the highest honors i think that you can achieve so but uh, but yeah we do have a, a a big class and we've got you know a lot of people and we need to you know get through it in a, in a relatively good time amount of time but uh you know it's it's hard to to tell people that they got to cut things back but i'm sure you'll do you'll, you'll do great yeah I'm, that's i'm still a little like i said it's still a little anxious on that deal um the question because I, I i've had it asked to me and i don't know the exact answer but what is the process of you know getting inducted into the hall of fame what processes do you guys go through to to get the the nominees well, we have um, criteria for each category of induction. So you're being uh, inducted as a steer wrestler. So as a contestant, the criteria is that you have to have, have won at least one world championship. Um, and then we, we also say that you need to be retired from the sport. Um, we kind of apply that loosely because in some cases, like a team roper, you could team rope until you're 75 <laughs> or 80. <laughs> You know, but you're not going to ride bulls that long, obviously. So, um, you know, when Trevor Brazil was was inducted last year, well, yeah, he's still competing, but he's not making a real serious run to the NFR each and every year and going down the road 100 miles an hour. So, you know, we, we kind of um, semi-retired, I guess, is more of an accurate description. But and then in the other categories, you know, to uh, contract personnel, stock contractors, those um, they have to rodeo committees, those would have had to have been a PRCA member for a certain number of years in good standing. So there is criteria for each category. And then anyone can nominate anyone. Um, and there is a nomination form um, that they have to submit with some additional information. And then we have a selection committee that gets together and weeds through, you know, each year we have well over 100, 150 nominees. And the process is when you're nominated, you stay on that list of consideration for three years. And if you aren't selected in those three years, then you drop off and would have to be renominated. But the selection committee is made up of people from our sport that that know um, about the nominees. You know, we have a representative from the rough stock events and the timed events. We have a, a stock contractor rep, a rodeo committee rep. Um, you know, contract personnel rep. And then we have two members of the rodeo media that cover rodeo on a regular basis, enough to the point where they know about these people's career and they've reported on it. So they have some knowledge. And then the members of the selection committee uh, rotate uh, on three year terms. You got all the angles and everything. So nothing can slip through the cracks there and make sure you guys get the best class each year as possible then. Yeah, I think so. It, it's a system that works really well. Um, and, and you know, like I said, we start with the list of 150 people and how we narrow it down to just a few is sometimes beyond me because <laughs> I can look at that list and, and argue that every single one of them deserves to be in this hall. 
but that's not possible. And the cream always rises to the top. And each and every year we think, man, this is the best class ever. And we're never going to be able to beat this. And then, you know, the next year there's awesome people that get picked. Well, and, and you, we talked about uh, a little bit about the cowboy bo- cowboy ball and, and having au- uh, items to auction off to help fundraise because obviously keeping the lights on and keeping the employees going that that's got to be a tough you know a tough deal um i don't know what tickets cost for people to come in there you know if that covers a lot of it but you need donations you need fundraising you need there's so much that goes into it to just keep the lights on and the doors open at the hall yeah you know um uh, museums are are difficult because um especially specialty museums Uh, you know we you if you're going to come here you're going to learn about rodeo and that's about it you know other museums that that are more broad in scope um, you know might appeal to a lot more people Um, but we have a pretty good uh, you know every year we get a pretty good group of people through here we can always say we need more folks to visit but but we do pretty well we have our a gift shop as well that's a money raiser for us and then we do events throughout the year we the hall of fame is an event venue we host weddings and banquets and dinners and different things here we have three event venues we've got the arena out back where we can put on some events and and then we do golf tournaments and and the fundraiser you know during inductions the auction and and that and then we do a couple of events out in las vegas during the nfr to raise money but yeah we have a membership program and but it comes down to yeah donations fundraisers um you know grants anything and everything that we can do to um bring the money together and, and keep this place going it's important we have great great supporters so if folks want that were watching the show wanted to donate what's what's the best way for them to to figure out how to get online or how to, how to make some donations um certainly there's information on our website and they can actually donate right on the website but if they would like to get a little more into the um, information and, and kind of see a special need that we might have they can certainly call and talk to one of us here at the museum and we're happy to help them uh, achieve that goal um, some people uh, you know we have an educational program for children and those kinds of things some people you know are are more can more uh, interested in seeing their money go to a specific place and we can certainly accommodate that other people just make a general donation both are important and um yeah we can help them out any way they they see fit that's that's awesome and how many visitors a year do you guys usually get to go through the hall um it, it hovers around twenty five thousand. like i say we can always use more but um you know we're on a we're on a pretty major interstate but nice. we are we're not in a ginormous city so um, you know, people, you know, if they're big rodeo fans, they're going to find us regardless. But uh, we get a, a huge amount of people um, coming through the door that are just curious. They want to learn more. They want to see what this rodeo sport is all about. Well, and I think a lot that drives, and, and you correct me if I'm wrong, but social media nowadays, you know, people could get on there and kind of figure out a little bit of what the, the hall is about and, and maybe pique their interest enough where they're going to pull off of uh and pull in there and maybe buy a ticket and walk through there. Yeah, definitely. We've got a huge following on social media and, and uh, you know, we've got signs out on the interstate and, and all kinds of things. So we, yeah, they they should be able to find us if they if they want to. Ken, I can't thank you enough for joining us on the Luke Branquino show. Uh, and, and I and I mean this, when I first got the call and uh, they were inducting me and I knew you were the director of the, the hall and, and I thought, man, Kent and I, We've known each other for almost 30 years and we come full circle from high school rodeo to to pro rodeo and out of the Hall of Fame. So I appreciate everything you've done for rodeo and and for the Hall and uh, looking forward to seeing you in July. Thank you. Thanks for having me today. It's a a dream job for me. I I love doing what I do and seeing these, these stories come to full circle is pretty special. So I can't wait to see you and it'll be a great weekend. I appreciate it. Have a good day. Thanks, Ken. Yep, thank you.